Today's podcast is sponsored by Fire Facilities Incorporated, expert engineers, designers, and manufacturers of steel training towers, burn rooms, and mobile units that are all made in the USA. Welcome back to Three Point Firefighter. Today, my guest is Kyle Samsing. Now, Kyle is a lieutenant with the Newport News Fire Department in Virginia. He's on Engine 2 in the East End. He's also a part-time firefighter for the West Point Volunteer Fire Department. Kyle has been an instructor at Andy Frederick's Days, uh, Andrew Frederick's Training Days, Art of Firemanship, and the Firemanship Conference in Portland. He's also been a hot FDIC lead instructor and a classroom instructor. He specializes in engine work and decision-making using the OODA loop. Brother Samsing, great to have you on here, brother. Uh, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So I know we're going to talk a lot about OODA Loop, and I can't wait to do it, but uh, it's a pretty impressive resume. You've taught at Andy Frederick's Training Days, Art of Firemanship, and the Firemanship Conference. Now, did, correct me if I'm wrong, did you actually make the Firemanship Conference in Portland? Are you the host of that, basically? No, that was uh, Cody Trestrail did that. I did... Mm. Um, I hosted a, a conference here in a small town I live in uh, called West Point. The Journeyman Fire uh, Conference did that for two years. That's um, what I was thinking of. Yep, did that a couple of years ago when we scaled back, um, partly because of COVID, partly because of there's so many events in Virginia that are high quality. Um, we started mm -hmm. taking registrations from each other, and you know I was the newest one of the groups, so I said, all right, well, you know, hey, if it's a good problem to have, let's just fold it and let these other guys move forward. And if there's a demand for it when COVID ends and people start traveling again, maybe we'll start it back up. We've had a lot of people um, request that we start it back up. We may just go to like a day or something like that of lecture and uh, see where it goes from there. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome, brother. Now, how did you get involved with Andy Frederick's training days? Uh, I attended every one for the, well, I missed the first year. Um, and then I was there every year for the next six or seven. And they started a program where, they had um, people that taught, but were also attendees would come in. So it's uh, um, the year after me, Brad Clark did it. Um, year before me, uh, I can't remember uh, who from Greensboro. Name escapes me off the top of my head. Um, but he did building construction. And I think it's a really good program to bring in guys that are attendees and passionate about um, Andy Frederick's training days um, to kind of contribute to it as well. Um, and so it was the first time I've taught in a big room. And if you've never been there, it's this big um, circle, for lack of a better term. Um, looks like a big letter C, but it goes straight up. And, you know, you see Brian Bastinelli's in the front row and John Salka's in the hallway in the bottom looking at you. Um, so no <laughs> pressure on anything, right? Um, and it's a stage that I've been going through for seven <laughs> years at that point. Um, so it, it was a great event. I still go there uh, as, as much as I can. Um, I missed the past last year i uh, just had to stay home with the family um but i was there this year and it was good to be back and, and support that organization because i'm a big uh believer in what they're doing with the the family frederick uh frederick's family foundation uh and supporting andy's family after uh, 9 11. that's amazing amazing brother now you also uh it says that you are you specialize in engine work and decision making using the oodle loop you obviously work with engine companies with that because truckies aren't that bright and they don't really make decisions they just break shit is that a pretty good understanding pretty much um <laughs> i i uh the oodle loop stuff can apply to anybody i i keep it simple to what i know i don't ride a truck um i'm an officer on an engine there's a lot of guys out there that try to you know Blanket statement, everything, and I think we we we've gone too far in that. Where guys are experts in everything, and I, and I try to be as honest as it can be. Is engine works my forte? It's what I do every day. It's what I've done every day for the last seven or eight years as a boss on the engine. Um, you know, you can take what I teach as far as decision making and apply it to whatever specialty that you've done. Tech rescue, you know, marine incident, hazmat, any of that stuff's applicable. But I try to relay it into terms I know because once I start telling people stuff I don't know, then I think you you your message gets diluted. It's like when I teach engine stuff, people start asking, well, hey, what about basement fires? We're like two feet above the water line here in Virginia and in, in the Tidewater area. So we don't have many true basements. Um we have cellars, something like that, but we don't have basement fires like guys do up north. So I leave that out of my program. I think it's very important that uh, instructors be as honest as possible um, about what they do. And so that's why I make sure I, I say, hey, I'm an engine work guy. And a lot of it's going to be relayed to in, in terms of the engine company or an EMS or, you know, extrication. Um, 
engine work education, education not um, tech rescue version, because that's just not the world that I operate in. Right. Now, with the OODA loop, something that kind of came from the military and has vast applications, uh, not not just for firefighting, but like EMS and, and, and well, just about anything that you have to make uh, critical decisions. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the OODA loop and how it plays into our job? Um, so pretty much when the OODA loop has applications to everything we do in life. Um, uh, for a long time, the fire department taught in terms of linear thinking, and we really need to go to more understanding how fluid it is. Um, it's more like complex geometry or kind of like three-dimensional chess if you start to get really nerdy. Um, and, and really, John Boyd described it as a composite of how we think and learn. And I explain it to people that you already make decisions through the OODA loop. The way the OODA loop helps you um, speed up your decision making is understanding those things. And again, familiarity breeds speed, you know, or uh, efficiency, which then in, in, in church uh, breeds speed. So what you look for in decision making is we pretty much make decisions two ways, explicit and implicit. And if you look at the OODA loop, you're breaking down it with the wrong, right person breaking it down for you. There's an explicit way, which is a very slow, methodical, um, something that you haven't seen before um, that you need to think your way through. And an implicit way, which um, Boyd called the implied and Got implicit guidance and control arm, which is the top of the loop, which actually allows you to jump right from observation to act, um, which, you know, if you were looking at other terms, it would be RPDM, uh, recognition, prime decision making, very much like right. that. Um, so that's all it does. And, and the reason why it's so applicable is because, like I said, it's already a description of how we think and how we act. Um, so just understanding that and teaching to people allows them to, to facilitate a faster decision-making process. And while it looks complicated on paper, it's very simple once you get through it. Um, <clears throat> so it really you, you mentioned John Boyd. John Boyd was a, a colonel in the Air Force, and he was teaching uh, fighter pilots about, uh, uh, you know, was it dogfighting, basically. Now, tell me if I'm wrong. And so uh, he came up with the OODA loop, which, which is observe, orient, decide, and act, right? Yes, sir. And the idea is to break their OODA loop while maintaining your OODA loop. Is that yes, fair yeah. assessment? So in, if you look at it in adversarial terms, in the combat terms, um, you want to speed up your loop while slowing or shattering their OODA loop, um, which goes to show you know, how natural of a thing that is, because more often than not, the people you're, you're in combat against or fighting against don't know that they have an OODA loop. But that's the thing is it's inherent in everybody. So you can actually slow it down and cause confusion. Uh, you want to call it kind of like rebellion on the other side, conflict within their group. Because if you can cause that, you can cause, you know, low morale, which teaches you to break the enemy. What's going on in Ukraine right now is a perfect example of how the Ukrainians have gotten inside the Russians, you know, OODA loop. And not only have they sped theirs up using that, they've actually, um, you know, been more efficient in causing the Russians to break down their OODA loop. It's called confusion, dissent among the ranks, low morale, and it's, you know, contributing to theirs even speeding up even more because they're able to do that. Um, but the, one of the things about Boyd is, you know, started off in the military. Um, they called him 42nd Borg, Boyd because he could fight a weapons school. He could shoot down anybody um, in a certain pattern in 40 seconds and no one ever beat him. Uh, and so as he went through and, and it made these, you know, design elements for print planes and, you know, designed the F-15 and F-16. Um, he, uh, he designed all these fighters. The F-16 is probably one of the most efficient, lightweight, single-plane fighter, fighter jets there is. And uh, he realized that the bubble canopy, which sits on top of the F-16, was one of the biggest assets to a fighter pilot. He could see more, right? So even if you had um, an aircraft that wasn't as good as the other one, if it had that bubble, bubble canopy, it allowed that, that pi pilot to see more and take more stuff in. So he realized that initially it was all about how fast you could turn, your climb rate, your speed, all that stuff. But then he realized there were American planes beating Russian planes in Korea that weren't as good. And what was the difference? And so eventually, um, like a lot of people have described it, he goes from the Red Baron 
to an intellectual scholar. He, the, the later works he brings up have nothing to do with the military. And so a lot of people always say, hey, um, you know, it's got an application for um, combat, but that's it. Not really once you start breaking it down and seeing um, how much it resembles stuff like Kahneman's work with the, you know, type one and type two thinking where type one is, you know, the implicit type two is again, the explicit. And it mirrors a lot of these things that were actually the precursors to Kahneman and RPDM. Um, and so it, it, it's definitely not only a theory, but it's rooted in application because he did it for so many years. And if you look through the military, um, the first Gulf War, a lot of that was maneuver warfare, which the Marines took uh, from Boyd and the OODA loop stuff from when he documented um, before his intellectual theory stuff. So I understand the, the high level uh, uh, explanation of the OODA loop. And I understand when you're dealing with, you know, say for your example, fighter pilots, right? So your, your uh, enemies have, have an OODA loop you're trying to slow down or disrupt. You're trying to speed yours up. How does that play into fire attack? Because you got to figure, you know, you have an OODA loop, but the fire does not. So but the fire can disrupt your OODA loop anytime at once, it seems like. How do you play it as far as being an engine company making, making an attack on it? So it, it, in the fire service, it doesn't have much applications of the combatant relationship as it does in John Boyd. Um, only to a certain extent, understanding that you can interrupt the fire's OODA loop by controlling the amount of oxygen, contents, ventilation, stuff like that. Um, water, you know, per, you know, appropriate water selection and application can interrupt that, you know, spontaneous chain of, you know, combustion and interrupt. It's an OODA loop, for lack of a better term. Um, but since it's non-thinking, it doesn't really truly have an OODA loop. But you can interrupt the process, which makes it interrupt yours. A lot of what I teach is your end of it and speeding your loop up. Because oftentimes the biggest problems we have in the fire service is we use implicit decision making when we should be using explicit and vice versa. You know, we get certain bogged down in the terms and people don't. Um, one of the big part about my classes is understanding that ambiguity and uncertainty are always present on the fire ground. You know, it's like saying that, hey, don't be in the air track. Well, Hey guys, you know, or, you know, flow path, the flow paths exist at every fire. And if you go through any door, you're always going to be in the flow path. So understand that that's not possible to not be in the flow path, just like on the fire ground, it's impossible not to have uncertainty and ambiguity. So what you're looking for, when you look at decision-making, there's two types of cognitive styles. There's maximizing and satisfying. Okay, so maximizing is the best decision possible. That's slow and methodical, right? That's when we go to hazmat situations, um, large industrial fires, that's something that we don't, don't do very often. For us, it would be probably a fire at the shipyard where they make the aircraft carriers because then you're not only talking about shipboard firefighting, you're talking about nuclear material on board of those, and they're pretty much floating cities. Um, and more often than that, what we need to be focusing on the fire service is satisfying, which is good enough. It, it's fast and takes pay, you know advantage of that uncertainty, but oftentimes um, you get that you know paralysis by analysis that people want to maximize these events, and it's really not the right thing to do because by the time you've made that perfect decision, the fire has passed you by, the event is already passed where you're trying to make the decision. So your decision and everything you're taking in to to form your mental models, all your observations are now different because. Where the fire was is now two doors down. It's in the attic, you know, or two vi windows have, have let out. Now you've got to d deal with a whole different fire than you, you had when you initially got on scene and started making decision making. So that's more the end of where I teach the OODA loop. You can impact the fire's OODA loop to an extent, quote unquote, um, by, you know, appropriate water and being good at your job. Um, and understanding ventilation profiles and understanding all the stuff that UL FSRI is, is come out, but you'll never get into the fact of causing chaos and disruption um, in its morale and other things like that. Cause it's not a living entity, but there is a, you know, a little bit you can do, but not a lot. A lot of it focuses on what we can do internally and how we perceive the environment and how we slow down or speed up when it comes to what's going on around us. So, <laughs> So, uh, how, where, so now, now walk me through it. So, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah. you're teaching me as a, a new engine officer, you're teaching me the OODA loop. So, stuff that I'm already doing, I just don't have that title to it. And now that I know I have that, that title to it, you know, the OODA loop, how do I apply it 
how do you teach me to apply it now to change my decision making to make it more rapid and speed up my OODA loop? So a lot of it is just application and training and understanding. Understanding your biases is a big one. Um, a lot of what we go up against, including like new information, you know, if you look inside that Orient box, the cultural traditions, you know, that can be either your internal or your external cultural traditions, whether that's um, how you've come up in the fire service or how you identify things um, or how those in your department and company, everything like that. If you run mutual aid, things can be different. Um, the analysis and the synthesis, which is just pretty much destruction and creation, right? So analysis is the breaking down of something that currently exists and uh, synthesis is creating something new, disrupting those bonds between something that exists and creating new um, previous experience goes into, you know, your RPDM and things like that and helps you do implicitly and understanding your genetic heritage, understanding how your eyesight works. A lot of people, um, you know, don't understand how their vision works. And so when you start teaching them how their vision works, they can be more observant. You know, we're um, trained in our genetic heritage to see life threats. But still, we march towards fire, pay only attention to the fire. Trust me, your brain sees that fire. You know, your brain is trained for thousands of years to see something that's going to hurt you. So instead of focusing on that, let's focus on the things that we miss that end up hurting us in general. You know, very few fire incidents happen where somebody gets burned or involved in a flashover without something else going wrong that they missed. And that's because their mind's aware of the fire conditions, but it's the, you know, the front porch that fails or the, the uh, chimney on the B side that comes down on the back of the guy, or, you know, the ventilation, the guy doesn't understand. He doesn't feel the floor getting spongy or the roof getting spongy underneath him. Um, so the way we train company officers uh, is to get them all into the same mindset, right? And so what you're looking for is to, to train guys to all have the same four things. Um, and what you're looking for with that is an intuitive feel, a mutual trust, a focus, and a mission contract amongst your company officers and your crew. And that allows for a cultural, a, you know, culture of decision-making amongst yourself. Um, there's not a whole lot of groundbreaking to it, right? What you're looking for to implement a lot of this stuff is an organizational climate for operational success. And so that organizational climate are those first four things I just mentioned, the intuitive feel, the mutual trust, the focus and the mission contract and the operational success comes through the OODA loop at that point, because now you've got the genetic heritage. You understand how your eyesight works. You understand how heart rate and things you do, your sleep, um, things you consume before and after work, whether it's caffeine or alcohol, um, work and, and go against you in your decision-making because it affects your heart rate and it affects, you know, your, your uh, stress levels up and down. You can get a more of an understanding about previous experience. Um, a lot of people like to say that previous experience only comes from actually doing it. But there's a reason why junior military officers see a valley and say, I'm not going down there. They don't need to be, uh, you know, targeted before to see that. They don't need to, to be uh, trapped by the enemy to see that. They've been told, hey, don't go into a situation like that by someone that's been there. And so their mind sees it and, and, and processes that in real time. So, you know, when you sit around the coffee table with guys and you understand that these are stories that they happen, your brain should be filing them away because there's going to be a time where you don't see something that you may not have previously seen that you're going to have to process those things. <coughs> Sorry, shaking off a little bit of a cold. Oh, no problem, brother. And so what you do, you know, in, in getting people to understand this is getting – unlock their possibility in their mind. A lot of people think that decision-making is picking between the two things. Anybody can pick between two items, right? That's, that's fairly easy. It's coming up with those items um, when you've never seen it before or being able to compare them to something you've seen before and go through it. So it's going, again, going through that explicit, implicit um, decision-making. What people fail to do is they, they, they fail to understand the process behind it. And that's what bogs us down and really kind of trips us up. So I heard years ago uh, a, a story and, and maybe you, you've heard the same story, but uh, supposedly a, a, a psychologist at a, a, or a professor at a, at a school wanted to learn about uh, rapid decision-making. Uh, and so his, his goal was to uh, embed with the uh, army uh, under fire with his students and, and observe this rapid uh, decision-making process. And he couldn't get anybody to 
want to embed it, you know, an army and, and live fire. So a second best thing was to follow uh, some firefighters around specifically. I believe it was um, a battalion chiefs. And I want to say Cincinnati, maybe I'm wrong, but anyway, he followed this battalion chief around from fire to fire to fire. And he would ask him, you know, well, what was your decision making? And the battalion chief would basically say, I, I don't know. I just, I just know what to do when I see it. I just know what, I know what to do when I see this particular thing. And through the study, they figured out that we file away uh, on our, our mental Rolodex pictures. So if we yep. go to a shotgun, one story over and over and over, you know, our brain picks that card and says, hey, this worked before, let's do it again. Or this didn't work before, let's not do it again. Uh, have you heard that story? And is that not a pretty decent example of, of the, the decision-making process under fire? It is. And I, I think that might have been Gary Klein as he was researching for um... – for the RPDM stuff for, um, but I, I could be wrong on that as well. But I think I, I remember, remember at least a, uh, uh, a statement about that. It, it could also have been uh, what's his name? Uh, Gladwell and blank. Um, but I'm not sure. And so a lot of those things that they talk about um, are described, like a lot of that stuff's theory, right? Like, well, I don't understand how I do it. I just do it. And so that's the way, you know, without going into too much detail here and driving people, you know, crazy um that implicit that implies implicit guidance and control arm between your observation and what the observation phase is is understanding um unfolding circumstances and outside information and they're two different kind of things even though they sound familiar and combining those to see what you see so the way even you get seasoned commanders better at that is by getting them better at observing right again going back to what we see how we see it, going over cognitive biases, understanding a size up, um, uh, you know, always having a plan, going through understanding gestalt theory, um, which is, you know, our brains try to make things simpler than they actually are. So oftentimes we miss things or we miss patterns because your brain's trying to just put it into the most simple way we can, because the brain at the end of the day is lazy. The brain doesn't want to go into that um, higher level of thinking because it just wants to relax. Um, it doesn't want to go, you know, thinking and understanding that, hey, we need to move our eyes around the fire ground. You know, I don't know if your listeners know, but we always say, hey, look at the big picture. Um, but in order to do that, you need to look around. You need to constantly be scanning because all you see in detail in your vision is like looking through a straw from a soda straw. And so if you think about that up against your eye, it's a very small field you know, uh, on a fire ground. So you need to constantly be moving it around. And so getting people that even have this implicit, uh, way to understand that we can improve their observation stages, um, really has a, a, a improving effect on the whole, as, uh, you know, the whole decision-making process as a whole. And you're right. It is described as a mental Rolodex, but you can actually build that mental Rolodex without, um, that experience as well. So all that RPDM stuff is just the OODA loop described in a theory as opposed to, you know, how John Boyd says the mind actually goes through these things. So I also know that um, a, a lot of times we, we talked earlier uh, before we started recording about uh, s somebody we both know, uh, Rob Lissetti out of Fairfax. And Rob teaches a lot of stuff uh, uh, as far as the mental aspect of firefighting, how our brain gets involved. And so I know that we struggle to keep into our prefrontal cortex, our, our, our reasoning, our long-term reasoning, as opposed to going into our lizard brain or amygdala, which is more emotional. Uh, it's, it's just, you know, your fight or flight, basically. How hard is it when you're dealing with the OODA loop to, especially in the fire service, to uh, stay in that prefrontal cortex, get that reasonable thinking going, as opposed to, I mean, w once you go into your lizard brain, if somebody's there not to pull you out, if you haven't trained for it, at least, uh, that could shatter that whole decision-making process you're trying to use. Absolutely. Uh, and that's why understanding the things that go into like genetic heritage are so important because then you start to understand how we can keep ourselves out of lizard brain where, whether, you know, it's through breathing exercises or just keeping calm and understanding it, things going into fire, um, you know, expecting fire, all that stuff like that. Uh, understanding your biases, right. Um, Understanding that we're looking at that because even if you look at like uh, <clears throat> I can't remember it was um, I can't remember the the name of the book that had it um, but you know you start going into lizard brain you know around what like uh, 180 beats per minute under stress and that's not you know 
uh, exercise induced. That's, that's, um, that's a physiologic stress plus uh, the outside stimulus. It's on combat. Sorry, it's Grossman. Uh, there's a chart I borrow from Grossman uh, in my class. It goes through like how you lose cognitive processing about about 180, 190, 200. Um, you know, even uh, you know 140 complex motor skills. So what you can do is you can simplify a lot of things you do. Um, so when I teach engine classes, like I eliminate choices. Right, choices should be made before the fire. So that way you don't have to stress out about, Hey, do I pull the, um, this pre-connect or that pre-connect, or do I stretch, you know, if it's a flat load, do I pull it this way or that way? No, it should be one way that you pull every time at a fire. So that way you're eliminating choices you have to make. So that way your stress doesn't go up. Obviously, um, if you're trapped or things like that, that's a whole different area of, of stress inducement and you've got to get your heart rate back down, including, uh, breathing and doing the, um, the box breathing and other things like that, that um, Rick George talk about um, and uh, uh, Rob also touch on as well. But, you know, understanding that, that good night's sleep, you know, cutting out the caffeine as much as I hate that to say that at all, you know, I'm, I'm a big, I'm a big coffee drinker, you know, um, talking about, you know, emotional state, you know, do we, do, do we talk to therapists? Do we take um, other things like that? Or are we, you know, we carry in what we, we have from the outside into work. Um, you know, a lot of guys bring in their, their off duty stuff in duty on duty, you know, and that, that can only add to it. And we can control these things, you know, we can control the sleep, go to bed early. Don't be up at your, your part-time job all night, exercise, um, you know, stay off the substances. Don't let your guys have two or three bangs a day, or at least say something, you know, cause it's, it's going to cause their heart rate to, to start at a higher level than it needs to be. And also increase their stress. You know, what are you eating for food? Do you guys just eat crap? You know, if you guys abide by the old, uh, if it ain't cow, it ain't chow kind of thing. Thing, or do you uh, <laughs> you eat healthy in the firehouse? And I'm I'm not the picture of health, you know. I'm I'm fighting my own battle of losing weight and trying to get back in shape. But you know, I I, I row every day and you know trying to do well. And then you know, including emotional state and psychological state. You know, I I'll be the first one to to, to say it. Um, I had problems drinking alcohol. I cut out alcohol for about a year now, so I've been a year sober, and it's done wonders for my emotional state and my psychological state. And that helps because you don't bring the stress into work. So beyond um, watching your heart rate, you know, a lot of those stuff you can control under that, that genetic heritage um, that we bring with us that can keep us in that right mind for decision-making and not let us go to lizard brain. Cause as soon as we go to lizard brain um, you know, it's really trying to uh, trying to get that back in that it's really difficult and without breathing and understanding uh, and slowing yourself down. I know we had a couple guys in a mayday a few years ago and they said, I just, I breathed, slowed myself down got back into where I needed to be thinking wise. And, 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 and we got out, you know, when four guys were trapped and all of them got out luckily um, and everything was fine, but it took a couple seconds of, all right, calm down. Let's bring that heart rate down. Let's get back under control. Let's not be dictated by emotions. And a lot of that also comes from training, right. And understanding that, Hey, we're in this situation. We've trained for it. We know what's going on. We know that the other groups on the outside are going to help us. You know, if we don't have, uh, competent people around us, guess what? Your emotional state's going to be through the roof because you're going, uh, crap, I've got these guys from the next district over that sucks. So I've got to do it myself. And, uh, you know, and so you're, it, it goes through the roof again. So again, that goes back to training, understanding what you got coming, going through all this stuff. Um, another good example is what happened with Nate. I don't know if you're familiar uh, with Nate Flynn, his fire in Howard County. Uh, Nate taught with us in, uh, in Howard at FDIC at the hot class. He fell through uh, a floor at a 7,000 square foot house building. Um, his company officer screamed on the radio and then kind of panicked and went away. Uh, and the, the, the other groups brought her, uh, the officer out, <clears throat> but you could tell that there had been no thought process to that. They went right to lizard brain, right? They had never thought, Hey, at one point in my career, I'm going to be behind the nozzle man, and the nozzle man's going to go down the floor and I'm not going to know where they are. And what happened was it's just blah, 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 screaming in the radio, you know, not, not calm, cool, collective at all. Whereas if you listen to the maydays and our guys and our fire, um, one of the officers was, was Brian Sanzo. I'm not sure if any of your, your listeners know, him, but he's a lieutenant on the rescue. He's got a lot of time in the fire department, a lot of time in the rescue. The captain was on the engine. He's very cool, calm and collected. Just mayday, mayday, mayday. Like, like they'd been there before. And a lot of them had, but a lot of them had taught Mayday because they were on the rescue. Uh, and that goes a long way. Uh, as, as much as Brian won't, you know, call it this, uh, 
you know, he, he had already seen it before. He thought this through. He had mentally rehearsed it. If you guys haven't seen uh, the videos of the blue angels, they sit down at a table before they go do their flights and they talk it through and they act, Hey, I'm pulling back on the throttle. Hey, we're going left this much. Hey, throttle up, stick right. Hey, John, come up beside me, you know, blow your smoke off all these things. And again, those mental rehearsals allow you that even if you, uh, in a stressful environment, like what happened with Nate, you say, Hey, I thought about this happening before guy went through the fire. Let's pull the nozzle back. Let's open it up. Let's cool the environment. They're down with us. Let's get a plan to get maybe a ladder or a hose or rope or something down to him to pull him out. Um, and if you're not thinking through those, you'll be caught by surprise. You know, I thought, tried to think of as many situations that could go wrong with me being boss as possible. And I've tried to get my guys to think of it as well. Even if it's just sitting around or, you know, watching your kids at the playground, my mind can be somewhere else. If that happens on the fire ground, at least I've thought about it. It won't catch me by surprise. My heart rate will still bump up because it's stressful, but I won't then have to process and be under stress that I never thought this would happen before. I'm only dealing with the stress of the event. So that allows you to stay within that moment and you can bring yourself down using those breathing techniques, you know, relaxing yourself, all the things like that, that um, I'm sure, you know, Rob goes into and all these guys that teach um, getting all that stuff like uh, Rick George, bringing yourself back down into that, that yellow state or that red state instead of that quote unquote black state where, you know, everything is just a mess. Today's podcast was sponsored by Fire Facilities, designers and manufacturers of realistic, built-to-last training structures and mobile units for 30 years. Make training count. Visit firefacilities.com for more information.